So I just wanted to talk to you, uh, Taylor, about the um, what's been happening with the Crave for Farms and the lessons really that I've got uh, from pursuing uh, all the intricacies of land law, leases, um, tenure, titles, all of those exciting things. About two years ago, I made a submission to the Seabed uh, and Foreshore Select Committee. Uh, the, it was the Māori Select Committee for the um, Seabed and Foreshore changes that they were mooting at that stage. And quite frankly, I don't know what happened to those. They seem to have sort of um, gone underground for a bit. <clears throat> but I produced a, uh, a submission, which uh, I'm going to pass on to you, and you can post it with this video if you'd like. Uh, where I'm talking about the history of um, what's called uh, a lodial title uh, and the differences that uh, crop up between um, our perception of uh, what, what Queen Victoria was and what she actually was. Uh, I'm talking uh, in the submission about the fact that in the treaty uh, she is uh, described as having uh, the lands of New Zealand uh, ceded to her. Um, well, she's not. No, she does. It's not talking about the lands. It's all all those things about sovereignty. Now, if you didn't know the history and what was going on in New Zealand at that time, you would think that might have been a war. There was no war at the time of 1840, um, but the idea of being having an empire and being an empress or uh, an emperor is to do with having troops that go out and, and fight in other countries and win uh, lands for you by, by shedding blood. That wasn't the case in New Zealand, and in fact, um, Article 2 makes it clear that um, the land, there's no claim on the land, um, uh, on the allodial um, status of the land by by the British uh, because sh she's talking about buying land uh, well or people buying land on her behalf so I think that if you think of the the, the treaty then as a settlement a peaceful settlement treaty for land and then look at Article 2 and say, OK, we're talking about Māori as proprietors. It's obvious that they're setting up as a, uh, a proprietor proprietorial system for, for titles, which means that you're prepared to sell land. And uh, the titles are the descriptions, of course. So that's why when you're... There was so much trouble with the surveying in, in Taranaki because that's the first step that you have to take when you're going to uh, prepare land for sale. You have to know uh, where it is, um, what size it is, and what are its boundaries before you can put it, um, before title can issue, all of that has to, has to be done. So, um, so then it becomes rather puzzling because the... Um, the issue of titles and tenure, which is, um, is, is the occupation and possession of, of the land for certain periods of time, is something that's been on my mind a lot for, in the last two years because of the, um, the Crafer um, saga and um, in a lot of other cases I've been pursuing with people. In, um, in attempts and and successful attempts for people to keep um, keep their homes. So, um, my uh, view of it is that the uh, we we described as having a, uh, being tenants in fee simple. That's that's our description. Um, when on any piece of land, on any piece of um, freehold land, um, we're tenants in fee simple. And we're either um, freehold tenants or leasehold tenants. And our tenancy is coming from the Crown. So the Crown is saying it has a lodial title. But as I was just saying before, the treaty makes it clear that there is no claim to a lodial title. So that must mean, in actual fact, that the Crown has a lease. 
how long is the lease? My guess is something like 3,000 years. And why I say that is because there is legislation in the UK uh, that talks about um, a 3,000 year lease or a 3,000 year uh, time period to pay back a certain amount of money. Now this is modern, modern, um, excuse me, modern um, statute. It's not something way back. Even if it was way back, if it's, as long as it's still on the statute books, it's still good law. So <clears throat> my guess is that, that the Crown has something like a 3,000 year lease, or maybe um, 2,500 years, and out of that lease it cuts a, a Crown grant. And that Crown grant, um, when it's actually granted to... Um, granted to um, individuals, it it takes on the um, the status of in perpetuity. However, when it's a, a lease, you can sometimes see how big their lease is. So if it's a, a lease from a lease, they'll put a time into that. So for example, um, <clears throat> the before the Unit Titles Act, um, if you lived in a, uh, a on a piece of land that had say three flats on it, the it would be divided up into what were called cross lease titles, <clears throat> and those, <clears throat> excuse me, are usually expressed as 999 years. Now that says to me that the 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 lease that sits above that, the crown lease from Maori, is probably. Um, at least 2,000 years, yeah, possibly more. So what's this all mean? Why am I interested, in, particularly interested in this now is because of the um, talk of the asset sales. Um, if, you, if you thought about this and, and tried to put it into a, a smaller context, say, say it was a farm, I'm not the owner of the farm, but I've got a very long lease for, for say, um, 80 years, 100 years. But um, I don't want to do farming anymore, so I say, OK, I'll, I'll grant a lease of 50 years um, to X. That's fine, OK? So I, it's a lease that that person gets. Now, what he's, he or she is going to do on the land is probably farm. Now, what if, though, I purported to sell the land to somebody else? Um, it's not possible, actually, um, to part with something that you only have a lease on. The other thing is, what might be the conditions that Māori were thinking of when they granted this lease to the Crown in 1840. Uh, would they have agreed with, say, fracking? Would they have agreed with um, mining? Would they have agreed with um, uh, you know, actually alienation of the control of the land, because of course the land can't be taken anywhere, but control of the land um, to overseas um, buyers, for example, or leasees in actual fact, tenants. So uh, I'm thinking that, that people need to get into their heads the idea that in actual fact the Crown, although it purports to be um, the ultimate, is only here on a long, long lease and that people should um, start considering that and thinking about um, um, that when we're talking about asset sales um, because when um, the lease that the Crown has is from um, people who held the land and collect the philodial anyway so you know who do you, who do you ask about um, who do you ask about? Uh, you know, should we should we make this lease or shouldn't shouldn't we? Uh, because it's all of the people in actual fact now, isn't it? Uh, so it's you know, and I think that was that was the idea probably um, 
you know, that Māori had the concept they would have had at the time of the, the signing of the treaty. Um, I think that the the word was that the Queen um, the Queen took the shadow, but the land stayed with the people. So, and I believe that that shadow is is, is actually the titles that they are talking about the titles because. Maori at that time would have been well versed in, in titles because that's how shipping was done um, and the actual fact the torrent system that, that operated here since 1840 is, um, sorry 1870 is a uh, shipping um, a shipping system so a, regis a ship's registration system so um, I think in 1835 what happened was the the that Māori entered into a, um, um, a shipping registration system that allowed them freedom of the seas so they wouldn't be affected by acts of piracy by the British. And um, and then, you know, it, it works very well. Um, you know, you can, you can set it up as the basis for a cash, uh, a cash flow system. So uh, that's and then you know we got the Treaty of Waitangi but it's not to do with it wasn't a peace treaty in terms of there wasn't an army came in and took over the land from Maori and said right you're out of here I mean they tried it again in in the 1860s um, but they had to declare they had to declare Maori to be um, um, foreigners to actually try and get their work their way around the legal implications of of martial law.